Uh, my name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And I'm Tamara Drought. I'm Vice President of Policy and Programs here at Demos and author of the book Strapped, Why America's 20 and 30-somethings Can't Get Ahead. Great. Um, yeah, maybe we should just start out with you telling us just a little bit about your book. It's really turned out to be kind of a hot issue. <laughs> well, you know, I wrote the book, it came out in 2006, and I was worried about this generation not being better off than their parents' generation well before the Great Recession. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about how this will be the first generation not to be better off um, as a result of the Great Recession. But, you know, the scary thing is all the trends were there before the Great Recession. Right, the Great right. Recession has just made um, everything a lot worse, but... You know, one of the big things happening to young people today is they earn a lot less than their parents did when they were starting out. And that is especially true for people that don't have college degrees. Right, right. And then, of course, there's these terrible debt loads that people are yep. having to incur for their education. And now that we have the Great Recession coming out to prospects of joblessness. So. Yeah, you know, I call this the, I call this the, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, I call this the debt for diploma system. Mm. And essentially, you know, two out of three young people borrow to pay for college. And uh, students from lower income households are more likely to borrow and they're likely to borrow at higher amounts. So the very students who, you know, need the most help to pay for college and make their way up that opportunity ladder are the ones who take on the most debt. And, you know, this is just like a sea change in how we pay for college in this country. You know, a generation ago, um, taking on student loan debt, it might have been a small amount to get you over the top, but it wasn't the primary way you paid for college. And, you know, we had a grant system that, you know, back in the early 1980s, paid for about seven out of every $10 of the cost of going to college. And today it pays for about three out of every ten dollars. Right. So the result is this debt for diploma system. And you know, I found it troublesome even before we had such high rates of unemployment. But now when you have young people coming out with twenty five thousand dollars, the job market stinks. Um, you know, it's it's a tough road and I think it's finally causing us to question, is this really the way we want to structure opportunity in this country? Right. And, and on top of that, I talked a little bit about this issue with a couple of other people. On top of the fact that there's this huge debt, it's also this inescapable debt burden because of yeah. the way it's set up, that there's no bankruptcy escape, that they're federally guaranteed, so they're almost kind of self-collecting in a sense, right? I mean, they're going to really bring the power of the state down on you. Well, you know, it's really funny. The joke is, like, if you move ten times in the same year, don't worry, your student loan people will... <laughs> <laughs> well, right, find you. Right, um, it is nearly impossible to get rid of student federal student loans through bankruptcy. Right, it's theoretically legally possible, but very very difficult to do. But it is actually not even an option to get rid of private student loan debt through bankruptcy. And this just shows you, you know, and that's just the power of the student loan lobby. You know, student loans, like one out of five, now take out private student loans, and, and the market is just booming. And those loans cannot be discharged and in any, be, ever. This, this would be through, like, Wells Fargo? Yep. Okay. So these are loans. So we have, like, the federal student loan system and a lot of private lenders. It's now all going to be directly lent from the government. But prior to that, it was the Sally Mays, the Wells Fargo's that would distribute right. federal loans. Okay. But on top of that, there's this private student loan business. Okay, it's, okay. Once you max out of the federal loan limits, right? Um, you still need to pay for college, you go to private student loans. And this is a huge issue for uh, the young people that get sucked into those for-profit two-year colleges. Oh, right. Yeah, and they come out with a mountain of debt and no real job prospects. So, you know, the the... The idea that the private student loan lobby was able to get carved out of bankruptcy, an exception. Right. This is the only type of loan that you cannot get rid of in bankruptcy. I mean, it's, it's shocking. It is. It is. So, okay, so let me get this straight. So, like, with federal student loans, there's this 
you can technically discharge it, but there's a hardship ex exemption, which is almost impossible to meet. But then with the private loans, there's just no discharge? That's right, none. Wow, that is incredible. So even if you, basically that means if you declare bankruptcy, you're not getting rid of those private student loans. You're on the hook for those no matter what. Right, right. That's, that is shocking. Um, and, if, and think of it this way. If you stop pay or can't pay, mm -hmm. there goes your credit rating. Right. The interest rates are going to continue to accumulate, so your balance is going to continue to grow. And, right. you know, you're, you're, you're screwed, basically. Right. So I've talked to several economists now, many economists, and um, talked to them quite a bit about, you know, what we should do for our short-term jobs crisis, this type of thing. And many of them are really concerned with, you know, what they refer to as the debt overhang or, you know, balance sheet problems uh, that exist. But they almost exclusively focus on mortgage restructuring and don't seem to include student debt forgiveness in terms of a general prescription for the economy. Um, and yet it would seem to me that the, the same argument applies. There's a slightly different issue with the mortgages because it also affects the housing market. Uh, foreclosures mm -hmm. affect the housing market. But just in terms of demand, I mean, I think I read that student loans were almost up to a trillion dollars now. So that's a huge amount of kind of reins on the, on the demand in the economy. Yeah. You know, this is a really difficult issue. On, I mean, on the one hand, I couldn't be more sympathetic to students that graduate with mountains of debt. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole system needs to be rethought. Is this really the best way to help students pay for college? And I think that fundamentally the answer is no. But when you get to the issue of debt forgiveness, mm -hmm. that's where it gets a little harder because, um, you know, do should a 22-year-old from an Ivy League institution with, $50,000 in debt, get that debt erased as opposed to a family who lost their job and is about to lose their mortgage and they can't get mortgage relief. Right. So, you know, I think there's some other options. I think lowering the interest on these student loans, you know, uh, the federal government can borrow at, at so low cost right now. Let's pass those on to students. Mm -hmm. You know, why should they be paying six? 6.8% right now, um, so I think we could bring the rates down, make it easier to pay back. And I also think we could do more. Um, you know, I know that President Obama just, you know, loosened a little bit the the cap on uh, how much discretionary income you can pay mm -hmm. on your student loans. You know, it's still hard to meet a lot of those tests. Um, the, it's like we've sort of said as, as a society, it's okay if you have to pay $300 a month, as long as that's not a certain percentage of your discretionary income. Mm -hmm. But it, we forgot the context of, you know, joblessness, um, whether or not you can rely on parents, which a lot of college kids don't have, you know, first generation college graduates, they don't have parents that can help them out. Right. And if you live in a high cost area, you know, so the idea that there's some magic formula where student loan debt becomes affordable, I think, um, is wishful thinking. And I think it's just indicative of trying to figure out band-aids on um, to fix a system that fundamentally is so flawed, you need a complete overhaul of how we pay for college. Right. And so would you support then, um, and I'll, would you support then just what kind of education system would you support? What would you like to see if you talk about a fundamental fix? What would be your dream? Okay, now this is going to be pie in the sky, but this Let's is... Let's do it. <laughs> you know, it would be um, Z to 14. And what that means is zero to two years above high school. So 14 years of school, totally free of charge. And then anything you want to get above and beyond that is, uh, you know on your own dime, but as a society and looking at what other nations do and the need for us to be competitive, this should be the bare minimum that we provide free of charge to everybody in this country who wants it. Mm -hmm. And and my understanding is that from talking for, to several economics people is that actually it's not that costly when we look at the cost of, okay, right, so it's, we're not talking yeah. about that big of a cost for a huge competitiveness advantage, or you know, for for a, a huge investment. Right. right. 
Well, you know, but Taryn, think about it this way. Right now, everything is a huge cost, you know, for the conservatives right. in Congress, right? You know, we can't right. afford uh, to make sure people have food to eat, right, <laughs> or that uh, moms, you know, can get the nutrition they need to feed their infants. Right. You know, these are the things on the chopping block, none of which cost us a lot as a nation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many studies show that any dollar that you put into education, you're going to get back, you know, $5, $7, and that's particularly true for early childhood education, which we do a horrible job right. of providing in this country. Right. And the reason why it's important is not only because it's important for young kids' development, but if you think about who has young children, it's people in their 20s and early 30s. Mm -hmm. You know, so this issue is yet it's another sort of economic strain on a generation and it's an area where our nation has not addressed sort of the changing nature of work, and that is that moms with young kids are in the, in the labor force. And every other developed nation provides early childhood education. Um, and it's something that young families can take for granted. Right. And, you know, right. we in the United States have not really um, gone down that path, and it's a huge financial strain for young families. And, by the way, it's one they, they're facing while they're still paying off their own student loans. Right, so right. This is, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, no, I, just, I just spoke with somebody who was saying, you know, we, we sometimes talk about this issue like it's a, something that you have in your 20s. But you talk to right. a lot of people, they have 20-year student loans. Yeah. Right. And you know, let's not forget that that's, the, that's how many years you um, have to pay before your loans are forgiven under the federal uh, right. The new federal rules, you know, pay for twenty years, and then we'll we'll say, okay, you've you've Summer paid enough. <laughs> they could be for, right, you know. And this is the time, you know, when you think about this is why I care about what's happening to eighteen to thirty four year olds. This is the time when you're deciding what you want to do for a living and what kind of education you need to get in order to do that. It's when you're buying a home. It's when you're starting a family. And those decisions aren't really made in a vacuum. They're made in the context of public policy and the types of opportunities available to people. And the reality is, in one generation, all of the things that helped the baby boom generation get ahead when it was just starting out have really been eviscerated. So we have, whether it's the cost of college, the price of housing, the fact that today's young uh, parents need child care and paid family leave, and the fact that we do not have good quality jobs for the majority of young people who don't have bachelor's degrees. Right. So we've just seen a complete sort of shredding of the social contract um, in a generation. Right, yeah. And you'll, I mean, David Graeber mentioned that um, somebody had gone down in the early days of Occupy Wall Street, the original people who were at the encampment, there were under 100 people who were originally there, and they were almost all young people who were very highly educated and had a lot of debt and who basically were saying, and, and, and I thought in terms of the social contract when I heard this, that, you know, we did everything they told us that we were supposed to do and were trapped and basically have no opportunity, nothing to look forward to, you know, no way to deal with this huge debt, you know, so it's just... You know, the young college grads are sort of like, I guess, the canary in the, the coal mine here. Right. You know, if, right. if the people who are the best educated and have, you know, done everything that was expected to them and drilled into them from an early age, right. if you want right. to get ahead, you got to go to college. Um, if they can't get ahead, then that's a sign um, that, I mean, just imagine, you know, two-thirds of, of young people do not have four-year college degrees, and their unemployment rates are double what they are for college grads. Their earnings have declined much uh, more deeply than they have for college graduates. So if we think college grads are having a hard time in this job market, it's not even, it doesn't even compare to what those without those degrees are up against in this economy. It, it is not pretty. Right, absolutely. Um, and so you, your organization, um, and I will link this, recently did a whole packet for young people. Could you describe that a little bit? Sure. So basically what we did is, um, it's called State of Young America, and you can go to stateofyoungamerica.org. We released it with Young Invincibles, which is a youth advocacy organization. 
And it's a couple things. Um, one is this data book, which provides um, all of the trends from, you know, how much young people make um, today, college tuition, which has tripled since 19, more than tripled since 1980. Right. Uh, student loan debt trends, poverty, the cost of housing, the cost of raising a family, all the things that sort of are happening during um, the 18 to 34 age period. And there's really easy to download charts and graphs. You can embed them in your blogs really easily. So that's one piece. The second piece is we commissioned a new poll of young people. Um, and so this has a great, uh, lots of great new data on how young people feel about uh, the economy and their own economic experiences. And then the third thing is stories of young people that Young Invincibles um, gathered during a series of focus groups they did all across the country with young people. Great. And so I'm, I'm thinking that they probably didn't think that their futures were looking very bright. <laughs> no, no, it's really, it's, uh, you know, today most Americans don't think the next generation is going to be better off. Um, and sad to say, I think that perception is just catching up with, with reality. Right. And only, you know, only one out of five young people think that they are going to be better off than their parents' generation. So they, they've gotten the message. Right. Right. And that, and that's really actually a first, I think. That's the yes. first in, since we've been keeping this kind of data. So that, that turn yeah. is really incredible. And well, so, and are we seeing an impact in, in terms of people going to college? Well, you know, the college enrollment rates have not declined because, you know, keep in mind one thing, you know, and we can all be sympathetic about young college grads having a tough time getting out there um, and getting started. But still in this economy, you are better off with a college degree and student loan debt in almost every case than you are not having that degree in terms of your earnings, in terms of your unemployment rate, in terms of your long-term economic outlook. Mm -hmm. um, it, it still is the case that college is definitely still worth pursuing, um, but we need to do something to make sure that we're lifting all boats here. So, yes, we have to solve the student loan debt problem, but we have to spend as much time on how do we ensure that we are creating good jobs here in this country that pay a decent wage for people that don't have four-year college degrees. And that is one of the big things that has happened in a generation. We've lost those jobs. They've been outsourced you know, to India, China, Korea. Um, and, we, and we haven't invested in new industries. So we have a whole generation of young people who've got great skills. They're more educated than the previous generation. And they can't get a job that pays, you know, more than 10 bucks an hour. So this is a real problem. Yeah, it is a real problem. So what, what do you think that people should be advocating for and and or doing people that are interested in these issues yeah so I think there's a couple big things um, and I would imagine you've probably heard this from some of the other economists we need to invest in America again so whether that's you know the rebuilding our bridges and roads and all of that stuff we also need to reinvest in our people so getting back to that let's have a real uh, free for all Z zero to 14 years of school paid for up front, no loans, no grants needed. It's part of uh, getting an education in uh, a global economy today. We also need to really invest in um, research and development, the kinds of things that fueled the previous middle class. We need to make those down payments again on um, innovations that, you know, you and I can't even dream about today, but that could right. fuel um, the next generation of high quality jobs and certainly you know alternatives to fossil fuels could be a big part of that so we need a major investment agenda um, and the big thing I think that Occupy has so right is we're not going to get any of these things until we get rid of the corporate dominance in our policy making right and that is it's you know it's I'm so impressed with the messages coming out of Occupy because they've connected the rising inequality and growing economic insecurity people feel with the completely um, d corporate dominated uh, politics that we have today. So until we fix our democracy, we're not going to be able to fix um, what opportunity and prosperity looks like in America. 
Right, right. So public financing of election, these types of things are kind of a prerequisite. If Citizens United. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, getting rid of corporate personhood, I guess, is the yeah. Citizens United. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think that that's definitely, if there if there's a single theme, I would say that that is it. And you're right. It It's, I think the 99% message is so good because it does focus both on economic inequality but also the political inequality and they're related right absolutely they're self-reinforcing so the more money a small segment of society gets the more they're able to leverage the political system our political system to their advantage and the more they leverage that system to keep rewriting the rules so that they become even more advantaged Right. Uh, it's exactly right. I mean, they sort of hit the nail on the head in articulating that the historic levels of income inequality we have are a di direct result of um, the great political inequality we have today. And, you know, if you sort of put up a trend line, um, the trends go in the same, the same right. direction in terms of the birth of the Chamber of Commerce and the, the rise of the real notion of an organized business lobby. You know, that started in, in the mid-70s, late-70s. Um, Jacob Hacker's new book is a great, great story about the rise of the Chamber of Commerce um, and how it, it was a pivotal, you know, well before Ronald Reagan, who we all sort of put up there. Um, you know, right. it, it's a, a coordinated, well-funded attempt to write the rules to, uh, to help businesses, at the, often at the expense of workers. And um, we are seeing what happens when our political system is largely captured by the wealthy and by the corporate interests in this country. Right. Yeah, you mentioned Hacker and Pearson. I actually, the story that they tell, which is essentially that, you know, at some point in the late 70s, there was, it's late 60s actually, there was a turn on the left to what they call post-materialist issues and away from kind of economic bread and butter issues and, you know, these kind of, four decades of work on really, in, you know, important issues, you know, feminism and ra civil rights and et cetera, but that, you know, economic issues kind of were left open in both parties so that both parties essentially were captured by these interests. And actually, I think that I, my hope is that in this movement, what you see now is a turn back now to economic issues. And hopefully those, that all that work for those four decades is not for nothing in the sense that it's much harder to divide the 99% along kind of right. cultural identity issues. Right. And so the younger generation, the people that you study and advocate for, you know, are less racist than previous yep. generations. They are, you know, more tolerant, less homophobic. All of the traditional ways that class, you know, that the middle class, working, cl working class has been divided among itself, I think there's hope to believe have been that there's been real progress on that in a way that hopefully will make this um, successful. Yeah, it's a great point because let's also not forget that, that the social contract really became under attack. I mean, conservatives never liked any of the New Deal to begin with. They've been fighting Social Security and Medicare for right. day one. Um, but they really started gaining ground when they started pitting us against each other. You know, as soon as women gained rights, as soon as African Americans gained rights, you know, it, be, it started becoming benefits for them or some other people. Right. And they really divided us and allowed us um, to, at the expense of all of us, um, let our social contract be completely um, shredded. And I think that's one of the great things about the We Are the 99% is that it is a big umbrella. Uh, I do think it's still important to realize that uh, the 99% is not getting hit as hard as the bottom 15-20%. Right. You look at the unemployment rate, white people are getting hurt in this economy, but black people and Latinos are getting hurt a lot harder right. and at much higher uh, rates. So, you know, those, those racial and ethnic differences are still really important today. Um, but I think the right thing to do, though, is realize that we all have a lot in common. We all have a stake in uh, fixing the political inequality that uh, confronts us. But let's not 
And in doing that, let's not lose sight that uh, disadvantage um, still largely falls along race and class lines in this country. Yeah, the numbers on that are just unbelievable. I actually, there's a, there's a group within our movement that's called Occupy the Hood. And so, oh. yeah, that um, is in some of the really hard hit communities um, in New York City, in, uh, you know, I think in Brooklyn, in some of the uh, very hard hit communities, but also New Orleans has an Occupy the Hood, Boston has an Occupy the Hood, Detroit has an Occupy the Hood, and my understanding is that the movement's really taking off. So hopefully, um, and, and I spoke with um, somebody who was a community advocate in New York City in, in some of those just devastated areas, um, you know, uh, uh, South Jamaica, Queens, uh, Bedford, yep. Stuy, Brooklyn, that uh, the foreclosure crises that are now hitting the rest of the country, that that was really ground zero for some of these oh, yeah. tactics, um, some of these predatory lending tactics, which I know that I think that you also have done work on that, on yeah. kind of predatory lending tactics. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Well, see, this is a great example where what started out as um, predatory lending that was really aggressively targeted in communities of color. Right grew out and we ignored it, you know, right. for years it was happening right. in communities of color. And lo and behold, what starts as a problem in communities of color doesn't end as a problem for communities of color. It has now infected the whole system. And so that's why paying attention to, um, you know, different experiences and disparities by race are so important. We all have a stake in what's going on um, in every community in this country. And predatory lending is a great example. Um, right. Well before they were in the suburbs um, and, you know, white people's mortgages were being converted into junk mortgages, uh, right. they had been operating in communities of color for, for years. Right. Yeah. And, and, my, and the community organizers that were there were reporting it. We're saying yeah. this is uh, this is it's going to be a systemic problem because you could see whole blocks wiped out by it. So there was yep. definitely a warning that it was happening, and those warnings were coming. So any claim that oh we never could have known is absolutely disingenuous. It's exactly right. I remember watching some of the first hearings and seeing you know all of the the high level of officials, whether it was in Treasury or the Fed, sort of like we had no idea this was coming. Right. I mean, it's laughable that they could actually sit there and say that, knowing right. um, that many people were pleading with them to uh, get these uh, lenders out of their neighborhoods. Right. So the person that I talked to, so I know I'd seen, actually, I think, a Stephen Colbert interview you did from, like, 2009, and you were on there yeah. talking about predatory lending practices and kind of, of the – yeah, of credit cards. And um, so people I've talked to who work with these issues, mortgages, but predatory lending practices, et cetera, are kind of hopeful about the creation of this new agency, the one that yeah. Elizabeth – are you hopeful about it? Do you think that there yeah. actually could be something there? Yeah, absolutely. If, uh, you know, we can ever get a director, although the right. person who is serving as a director right now, Raj Date, is, I think, doing a great job. Um, and Elizabeth Warren is obviously, uh, you know, going on to fight the good fight in a different venue. So I am very optimistic. You know, if you think about if we would have had a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, mm -hmm. first of all, we would have been able to isolate these incidents and say, you know what, this shouldn't mortgage companies should not be able to sell these kinds of mortgages that clearly cannot be repaid, that are clearly deceptive. Right. Now, we could have said we've got a problem with the brokers, we've got a problem with these mortgages, and hopefully we could have contained it before it got all the way up to the place where Wall Street slicing and dicing, you know, pulls of, right. of hundreds of thousands of these things. So, you know, I do think before it was the case, you know, every – the seven – you know, half dozen or more agencies that had some type of authority over consumer protection for financial products, you know, they kept passing the buck. It wasn't clear who was going to do it. They were issuing guidelines. Uh, some of them didn't have the authority mm -hmm. to do outright prohibitions, which is what should have been done. And this bureau is going to have that kind of authority and that kind of teeth. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm really optimistic um, that at least, you know, when, when it comes to Basic protections, um, we will we will see some real gains. So hopefully, consumers uh, 
don't have to deal with this kind of uh, complete, you know, outright deception um, and fraud again. Right. So since the Occupy Wall Street movement has started, so I guess it's been about two months now, um, coming up on two months, uh, have you noticed that the conversation has changed, has shifted? Yeah, I mean, this is what's the great thing is I, I do feel like, you know, we are now actually as a nation having a conversation about inequality that we have never really been able to have. You know, rising inequality has been with us now for two, three decades. And it's either been sort of dismissed as, well, that's just what happens in a dynamic capitalist country. Um, and, it, you know, I think that with great credit to the Occupy movement, it said it's managed to say not only is inequality really to toxic to our democracy, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen by accident. Right. That this is the deliberate outcome of public policy decisions that have been made against the 99% interest for a really long time. And so I do think they've shifted the movement. And I think the next big hope for me, anyway, is that they're going to shift the political conversation and, um, you know, open up the space for progressive candidates to really run and put out some bold reforms and stand up for the values of the 99%. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, I think, how Elizabeth Warren's campaign goes, given how much yeah. I think she's going to be outspent. Yeah. Um, and given that she's really embraced a kind of full-throated economic populism that yeah. I haven't seen on the left in quite a while. So it's refreshing. And, and people are loving it. Right, you know? exactly. It's like there is a real demand out there for a uh, full-throated economic populism for standing by your values of, you know, we we need a fair taxation system. If you do well in this country, you give back to this country so that others can have that opportunity. So, you know, I think it's great, and hopefully, you know, uh, her candidacy will become a playbook that politicians will, will study and, and start to follow. Um, uh, obviously, that means she has to win, but... <laughs> Right, um, <laughs> right, and uh, like I said, I mean, I, we know she's going to be very outspent, so it'll oh. be interesting. But I, I think, I think that, I think that you know, given the fact that, you know, I tend to link our our movement at least in its, um, at least I guess in the economic populism, also to Wisconsin, and you can just see yeah. that there's, I think, a real thirst for it in this country at this yeah. point. And so I that that does make me very hopeful. And the last thing I'll say, what we need to wrap up, we've taken up too much of your time already. I know you're incredibly busy. Uh, but the last thing I'll say is that, you know, just to thank you for all of the work you've done all these years, you know, kind of laboring alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have company. I know, I'm exactly. I bet, yeah. I bet. And that's what everybody, I've almost everybody I've talked to has said, we really felt alone. It was very hard to yeah. continue to do this work and to have yeah, these yeah. very important conversations, and you just felt like nobody was listening. Yeah. Um, and so Here, I, let's leave you with a thought. Okay. Which is, um, so I'm from Dayton, Ohio, originally, and I'm a first-generation college student. And my mom is sort of a quintessential swing voter, so she voted uh, – for Reagan, then she voted for Clinton, and then she voted right. for Bush one, um, and then you know she voted for Bush twice, but she voted for Obama. And so I asked her mom, "What do you make of this Occupy Wall Street?" This was maybe a month or so ago, and without even thinking about it, she said, "You know, I think it's about time somebody's out there sticking up for us." Right. So this this is resonating with people. People are glad somebody's out there talking about the fact that this system has been rigged against them. Right. Um, and I, I'm optimistic and very glad to have company. Well, thank you so much. So I very much can't say enough how much I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. It's been very my nice pleasure. To, very nice to meet you. We will, we yeah, will you send too. you, we will include the links. If there's anything else you can think of, let me know. And okay. we will let you know when it's posted. Great. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you.